This video talks about why we invented businesses, talks about how they work, why we created them, and how they made society prosper and laid the foundation for everything in modern day. What is a business? A business traditionally is defined as something that provides goods and services in exchange for profits. For its owners, of course. However, this is inaccurate since businesses can operate very efficiently without money and have operated without money since their origin. Money was developed long after the traditional business concept was invented and owners will eventually just use that money in exchange for goods and services. So its purpose really isn't to provide goods and services in exchange for money, but so the owners can get the results of those goods and services sold converted into goods and services that they didn't want. So it's more accurate to say a business is a system where someone provides goods and services in exchange for other goods and services. Since this exchange is managed using money, money itself has no value and acts simply like a median for exchanging goods and services. And I explain more about this concept in my video, Why Money Was Invented. So what is a business transaction then? Well, it's a social interaction between two parties where one good or service is exchanged for another good or service. Now, traditionally, economically, we define the concept of economics to be inherently everyone's gain is someone else's loss, and everyone's loss is someone else's gain. This essentially defines the entire nature of businesses and the economy to be a system of win-loss transactions, where someone's always winning and someone's always losing. However, this system would collapse long ago if this was true, and I will explain why, and it would never have gotten started in the first place, which I'll also explain. A business transaction is just a type of social transaction, and all social transactions form one of the six relationships. Win-win, win-neutral, win-loss, loss-loss, loss-neutral, neutral-neutral. The definitions of what these things mean is fairly obvious. Winning means they gained, loss means they lost something, and neutral means nothing happened to them. Now, business transaction is a deal, negotiated, and it's entirely voluntary. Therefore, if both sides agree to it, therefore we have to presume they agree to it for a reason. And who would agree to an interaction that resulted in a loss? Therefore, if it's a voluntary social transaction, it could not have had a loss occur. But no one would also agree to a social interaction that was completely neutral. So therefore, the only possible explanation is that all business transactions, if they exist or occur, and they're not forced, must be a win-win relationship. Therefore, in business transactions, everyone gains in all business transactions. So how is this possible, you're probably wondering. To explain this, here's an example. We've got Alice and Bob. They both have a package of goods. Now, most people in a traditional mindset in modern day think these packages have a fixed universal value. And since money is not technically required for this transaction, I'm going to define them by an arbitrary measurement system called UVI, Universal Value Index. And that declares that these two packages in the general perceived mind of both individuals are worth the exact same thing. The question is, why would they trade two packages for the exact same thing to each other? This transaction provides no benefits to either party. However, if Alice's package was universally acceptable to be defined as 150 UVI and Bob's is 100, Bob would be motivated to trade his package for the higher value good. But this would be a win-lose situation because Bob would win and Alice would lose. Therefore, Alice would have no motivation to participate in this transaction. In reality, people don't view things from a fixed universal value. 
people have different opinions on what value something is. This is a contextual value system. This dictates that the value of something changes depending on its context. In this case, everyone has a defined value of which they value something as. The value of this depends on various factors, and the primary factor is how useful it is to that person. If someone has an excess of something, the excess is worth nothing since they cannot use it, but the items they can use have value, and the more valuable it is to them, to their unique context, to their unique situation, the higher its value. Items have, therefore, two values, their personal value and their trading value. The trading value is essentially what another person perceives its personal value to be in their unique context. In this case, Alice's package to her is only worth 50 UVI, but is worth 100 UVI to Bob. Bob has a package that's worth 50 UVI to him, but is worth 100 UVI to Alice. This way, from both sides' perspective, they are gaining something of greater value to them than the item they are giving up, because the item they're giving up is more valuable to the other person than themselves. As a result, when they trade, the values swap. The trading value of Alice's package is now 50, because Bob views it as 50. But she has more value for it. Therefore, she's going to hold on to it and not sell it. Because there's nothing of greater value that anyone would give for that package. Same case goes for Bob. Because of this fact, if they both trade, they both win. But if this transaction is reversed, they would both lose. Because of this concept, if a person produces an excess of something, the excess is worth nothing to them. Therefore, they wouldn't produce it. So no matter how efficient someone is at something, they're only going to produce the same amount, how much they need. However, if they are weaker at one thing, then they have to devote more resources to that task. But if they're strong at something else, they won't be able to devote those resources to it because they may have to devote it to a more essential task, say farming versus a blacksmith. A blacksmith could not possibly be a blacksmith if he had to farm all day. And if he wasn't good at farming, he would have to devote more resources. But someone else who's really good at farming, who could use those metal tools, but would have no reason to produce any more than they need. Because of this system, each one can trade their surplus of their talent, of their good and service that they can produce with high efficiency for the strengths of another. As a result, they can compensate for their weaknesses with another person's strengths. The result is a person can be really efficient at a task that they're good at and not have to worry about being good at the more essential things if someone else is good at it. This way, this takes the strain off of them. Instead of having to put a lot of resources into a weakness, they can devote the majority of the resources to their strength, maximizing efficiency and allowing for larger diversity of strengths and innovations. This creates diversity in the goods and services that the whole community can have access to and increases the efficiency at which these goods and services can be produced. The result of this is a feedback loop where every innovation reduces the effort and load on the general community and on the individual who creates such innovation. The result increases the availability of resources to work for future innovations, which then reduce effort even further. The result in diversity and the continuous prosperity of society, and the society will grow continuously as a result of this, with each new innovation laying the foundation for further innovations. Now, if I can hold your attention for a bit longer, I'd like to talk to you about all the results of this first entrepreneur who invented business. Well, the first entrepreneur laid the foundation for morality, socialization, cooperation, economics, trading, the foundations for government, institutions, infrastructure, and community. The most interesting of which is morality. And you're probably wondering, how did business create morality? 
Business ethics today is generally referred to as an oxymoron. But I'll explain how if it wasn't for business, we would not have any reason to be moral to this day. At any given time in our lives, we can be either competitive or cooperative. The motivation to compete derives an idea by eliminating our competition or denying them access to a resource. We gain access to it ourselves, giving us an advantage. The motivation behind cooperation is simple. We cooperate so together we can gain more than we were apart. But cooperation requires mutual gain, or else both parties would have no reason to cooperate. Since the business model was the establishment of a mutual gain system, it created the concept of cooperating for a greater good. Once we start cooperating with one another, we need to establish a system of trust. And the best way to ensure that is to create ethics a series of guidelines to regulate our interactions in order so we can build relations and trust one another. In further support of this idea, I'm going to show you the Lewis Tilburg's Six Stages of Moral Development. The Six Stages idea states that there are two stages of pre-conventional morality and two stages of conventional morality and three sta two stages of post-conventional morality. The theory dictates that all morality develops in continuous form from the first to the last stage. The first stage, people simply do things to avoid consequences. So they don't do bad things because they'll be punished. And then we eventually develop the sixth stage, where individuals establish their personal rules and guidelines, and they commit their actions accordingly, and often enforce those moral guidelines on community. How did business help start morality? Well, it kick-started stage two morality, which is to do stuff for others for personal gain. Stage two is, what is it for me? But if you really think about it, that's what business is. It's about doing stuff that is mutually beneficial for others. And we have to start somewhere. And there was no reason for us to even get involved in morality until there was mutual gain involved. Stage two had to happen first. And even though this is a pre conventional moral system, it was the first moral system. And it was the foundation of later moral systems. If we didn't invent business, we'd have no reason to cooperate with each other for the purpose of mutual gain. And if we had no mutual gain, we have no reason to develop socialization. This resulted in a revolution where we evolved from solitary creatures with very limited needs, self-sufficient, completely independent, and have no empathy, to solidarity creatures who find the concept of being alone so repulsive that it's a form of torture. And as a result, we evolved from immoral beings with our reptile brains to the modern mammal brain of solidarity creatures that believe in socialization and cooperation for mutual gain and a greater good.